When we think of space, we generally think of space as being pretty empty. Even the word itself implies emptiness. But in reality, the interplanetary space, or even interstellar and intergalactic space, is filled with all sorts of materials. And although most of it does not really affect us, some of it, especially interplanetary dust, can actually create a lot of problems, especially when it comes to future manned missions. And because of this, a lot of scientists today have been trying to understand how exactly interplanetary dust works, what creates it, and if we can actually predict some of the patterns when it comes to, for example, predicting the location of the most dense regions of interplanetary dust, and thus avoiding it in some of the future missions. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about some of the recent discoveries coming from the Parkers probe in regards to interplanetary dust. And specifically two different studies that identified major sources, or I guess major points of origin, for a lot of interplanetary dust that can hypothetically endanger future missions. Now first of all, obviously when it comes to dust itself, we don't generally think of it as something dangerous. We think asteroids and meteoroids are dangerous and possibly can cause damage to a spacecraft, but statistically speaking, these objects are actually more or less irrelevant to some of the future missions. Yet this, or the phenomenon known as the shooting stars, is actually quite relevant. This right here is a lot more dangerous and can hypothetically produce a lot of damage for any kind of a mission between, for example, Earth and planet Mars, or even Earth and the Moon. Now, one good example that comes to mind is from the Space Shuttle mission back in 1983, specifically the STS-7 mission, that officially reported the first ever space debris collision that could potentially be somewhat dangerous. This is actually the window from the Space Shuttle that was most likely hit by some sort of a tiny, tiny piece of paint that was moving at a ridiculously fast speed. And so obviously on a much longer mission, specifically a mission moving between planets that might last several months, a lot of such collisions could be possible, and so trying to avoid them and trying to predict them in advance would be extremely beneficial for future missions. And the thing is, we've already discussed one of these phenomena known as the Zodiacal Light in one of the previous videos, where one of the missions, and here we're talking about the mission to Jupiter known as the Juno mission, has experienced a dramatic increase in collisions when it was transferring from planet Earth to planet Jupiter. And here it passed through the zodiacal lights that we believe were produced by planet Mars. Or in other words, the dust from Mars itself was sort of circulating around the solar system and is very likely responsible for this phenomenon we refer to as the zodiacal light that we generally see in the night skies right before the sunrise or right after sunset. But obviously Mars is not the only source of this. As a matter of fact, in the past it was believed that asteroids and comets most likely produce most of the interplanetary dust. Mars as an origin of these particles was a surprise discovery. But this was an important discovery because during the transit, several major collisions occurred with the solar panels on Juno, which in theory could actually be really damaging for any manned mission. And so this beautiful phenomenon responsible for the shooting stars on Earth theoretically can be very damaging for any manned mission that lasts for longer than a few months. And just in case you were wondering, these tiny particles are actually really really small. They're called interplanetary dust for a reason. Most of these particles are microscopic, with some of them being only ten thousandth of a millimeter, which makes them practically invisible. But when they collide with something, because generally they have speeds of anywhere from a few tens of kilometers per second up to about 80 kilometers per second, they can easily puncture a spacesuit or a relatively thin window, and in some cases they can create a lot of other damage as well. So for example, if they crash into a spacecraft, they tend to completely vaporize and also create a lot of electrically charged particles which is, by the way, how the Parker probe is also able to detect them as well, by measuring the overall electromagnetic field around itself and detecting the sudden jumps in electromagnetic emissions when these particles create the charge from the evaporation. This presents a perfect opportunity to study and to analyze the actual collision effects from each of these particles. And so for the Parker Solar Probe, that's going to become the closest object to the Sun by 2024, it already got to pass through a lot of different regions in the solar system, and during its journey it also got to experience collisions from a lot of interplanetary particles, a lot of dust particles, with various sources of origin. 
And because the cloud itself is almost impossible to see except for maybe certain locations and certain specific conditions when the light from the sun strikes the cloud in just the right way, creating some sort of a useful interplanetary dust map and also figuring out the exact patterns of where the dust is the thickest is really really important for these future missions. But generally the scientists today believe that it's probably the thickest right near the sun. As a matter of fact, it most likely resembles a typical protoplanetary disk. Here it's going to be the thickest closest to the sun, it's going to have certain dips here and there, and it probably also has certain regions around planets where it's also thick as well. But even though generally we can see this in other star systems, mostly because we're looking at them from the outside, in our own solar system we have to rely on probes like the Parker Solar Probe to try to map the distribution of the interplanetary dust. And so the recent two studies discovered at least two more different sources of the interplanetary dust that we have to be aware of for some of the future missions. Now one of the reasons why Parker Solar Probe is probably the best probe to study all of this is because close to the sun we sort of expect the highest and the thickest levels of dust and because of this it collides with itself the most. When the collisions like this happen this ends up creating even tinier fast moving particles that are usually referred to as beta meteoroids. And because these particles are so so tiny, the solar pressure, the solar radiation, ends up pushing them away from the sun and so they actually slowly escape the solar system, or at least stay on the outskirts. But interestingly enough, these particles are produced by what's known as the alpha meteoroids. And these particles have an almost completely opposite type of motion. These are actually the dust particles that are slightly larger and are slowly moving closer and closer to the sun. And when these alpha meteoroids collide with each other, that's when they end up producing beta meteoroids. Although that process of spiraling toward the sun can actually take several million years. But the collisions once they happen end up releasing beta meteoroids that move even faster, but in this case they're also kind of more or less random in terms of direction. And so because of this randomness, at the moment they're sort of unpredictable and to some extent kind of dangerous. But much more surprisingly, and I guess much more interestingly, was the discovery of some beta particles, some beta meteoroids, that had an extremely precise direction and were always happening in the same spot. The actual emissions looked something like this. And as you can kind of see from the simulation that you can find in the description below, this was most likely caused by some sort of an asteroid or a comet that very likely left a lot of particles in a kind of a torus shape. And interestingly, as the particles from the comet or the asteroid or from the steroid shape collide with the particles that represent these so-called alpha meteoroids, or basically these leftovers from the protoplanetary disk, they ended up producing very directional beta meteoroids that were always sort of pointing in the same direction. Something that the scientists behind this paper referred to as the beta stream. And this right here represents probably the most dangerous of these particular particles. Mostly because of the total density of these particles and because they're always sort of moving really fast in a single direction. By the way, this is exactly how the shooting star phenomenon is produced as well. Our planet Earth, once in a while, moves through these so-called toroids produced by ancient comets. Inside of these toroids are a lot of different dust particles that when they collide with the atmosphere of planet Earth, end up producing the shooting stars. With the only difference here being that these particles are not really moving as fast and not in the same direction. Whereas in the beta stream, they would be moving in the same direction and also extremely fast. And so if a spacecraft were to fly through this, it would be almost like flying through this stream of extremely fast moving tiny particles, with each of them having enough power to create a tiny hole. And though the spacecraft itself might be okay depending on the protection, if one of the astronauts has to go outside in order to possibly fix something, that's when it becomes a problem. Each of these particles has enough power to easily pierce an astronaut's suit. But the good thing is that these beta streams, despite their danger, would also be the easiest to predict and the easiest to anticipate, assuming we can actually find all of these toruses, all of these leftovers from various comets and asteroids, and can somehow map their movement around the solar system, which would potentially create a kind of a map of things and areas we should kind of avoid, and also areas that are more or less safe. And so because of the Parker's solar probe interaction with all of these meteoroids and all of these tiny particles, or basically because it experienced its own meteor shower, it allowed us to create at least one of these tiny maps of the region really really close to the sun itself. 
while also discovering some really important features of most of these interplanetary dust particles and how they sort of interact with one another and also what dangers they pose to future missions. With this one right here being probably the most dangerous of them all. This is something that a lot of scientists will probably have to study in more detail in order to determine if any of these unusual beta streams exist on, for example, the way from Earth to Mars or from Mars to other planets. Because that's definitely something that you would want to avoid if you're flying from one planet to another. And if one day we end up becoming an interstellar species, well, this is a phenomenon that we can expect from every other star system out there as well. But before that, if one day we want to try to colonize Mars, we definitely have to be aware of all of this and be prepared for any potential damage caused by these tiny invisible particles, many of which are produced by Mars itself. And so just to summarize the three major discoveries here, we first of all have these alpha meteoroids, which are probably either the leftovers from the early solar system or possibly some of the dust from the asteroid belt and from some of the other region that's kind of slowly making its way toward the center of the solar system and is coming closer and closer to the sun. We then have these extremely fast moving beta meteoroids, which are much smaller in size but are also moving way faster, and these are produced by the original particles colliding with one another. And we lastly have the beta streams, which are also particles that collide with alpha meteoroids, but are generally produced from leftover comets or asteroids. And generally, all three of them very likely pose danger to some of the future missions. So trying to map their density around the solar system and also identify certain regions we should avoid is probably going to become a priority if we do become an interplanetary species one day. But until we start exploring the solar system and until we start mapping all of these dust particles, that's I guess all we know for now. I'm sure a lot more information is going to come from the Parker Solar Probe in the next 5 years or so, but even these few years of its operation have already revealed so much about the solar system. Anyway, once we learn something else, I'll make sure to follow this up with one of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.